Sure. <laughs> Welcome to First United Methodist Church. We're glad you've come today. If you are a visitor or if you are a member or a constitu constituent, would you please be sure to sign our pads that will be passed among you? We want to know if you're visiting so that we can respond to you this week. And if you have questions about this church, we'd like to be able to put you in contact with people that may know the answers. You are welcome here no matter who you are, no matter what your situation is, whether you're, you're economic or you're educational or whether you're LBGTQ, whether you are straight, whoever you are, whatever you're about, we want you to know that you are welcome here at First United Methodist Church. And if we haven't made you feel welcome, we also want to know that because our intention is to welcome everybody. As we seek to build the the, this congregation as the body of Christ, we want to remind you that this is our kickoff Sunday and it's the beginning of many ways for you to serve and become more involved in all that this church has to offer. So check your bulletin announcements. There are so many opportunities for service that, and people that you can contact for information and so forth. You'll also find new opportunities for our music ministries, our Sunday school classes. Adult classes will begin September 8th. And there are so many opportunities for mission service projects, small group gatherings. So read through and find your niche for being in service and in ministry here.
please stand if you're comfortable doing so for the call to worship, which is based on Psalm 50. The mighty one speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, the God of our creation shines forth. Gather to me, my faithful, ones who made covenant with me by their sacrifice. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon God. I will deliver you, says the ever-present God, and you shall glorify me. days of the ancient church, the leader said to the people, may the peace of Christ be with you. And the people, re <laughs> would, and that's fine. There's those who know, and there's some, maybe somebody that didn't know. But I would like for you now to find somebody you don't know and offer them the peace of Christ.
Let's see, is Miss Joy here? The epistle lesson today comes from Hebrews chapter 11, 29 to 34, and 39, 12, 2. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land, but when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raising, raging fires, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness because became mighty in war, put for foreign armies to flight. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. For children's time, come on up. Come on, how's everybody doing? Good, awesome, that's good. Hey, I brought some stuff for you because, you know, I don't know, some of you know, some of you don't. I, um, I'm a volleyball coach at Westside. I've taken on a new role, I'm varsity assistant, so that's a big role for me. And I always have to take all my stuff. Now, I always, for volleyball, I always have, now this volleyball in particular was one all my girls signed for me Oh, several years ago, these girls are all juniors now, but I always have a volleyball with me in my bag. Always have to have knee pads to protect the knees. I always carry extra in case girls forget. There's, I always have my volleyball books because I have some playbooks and I like to come up with some big plays. I always have to have my score book because I have to keep track of the score so it's accurate. I always have to have my volleyball shoes, so I always have to be prepared. Um, because sometimes my girls aren't prepared, and sometimes I have to motivate them to get prepared. Now, they could remember all their stuff. They could remember everything, but you know what? Sometimes they become like this volleyball. They become deflated. Now, what do you think that means when they become deflated? Now, it's easy. With this volleyball, with this volleyball, it's kind of easy to go. I take it into the room, and I can blow it up again to make sure that it becomes inflated again. But it's a little bit different with players or people. Okay, I can't just blow air into them and say, oh, you're better. It's all okay. Um, I have to do a lot of things, and I like to do motivational stuff. Every day at practice, I give motivational words of wisdom. You know, one, one day I gave team. What does team mean? It means together everyone achieves more. And another one I gave, hustle beats talent when talent doesn't hustle. So I like to, yeah, that, is, yeah, that was one of my favorite ones, yeah. So I give a lot of, because I think it's motivational, I think it's good be, um, to give people words of advice and but words of motivation to let them know what they can do even when they become deflated. Now, even as a coach, there are challenges that I have, and even as you guys have some cha challenges. This year, like I said, I started with a new team, so it means it's a little more in-depth for me to have a team. Um, and in school, some of you may be in a new school, you're in a new grade, you have new classmates, you have some new friends. You may be, if you're older in college, you may have new, a new place to live. You may have a new state you're living in or city. And you have a new teacher. Yes. 
Well, that's awesome when we have people we know they're in our classes. But you know what? That's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of challenges that we have. And it is a new school year for uh, some of you just started. Some have been going for a week. But, but I want you to know, in the psalm, it says, be still and know that I am God. And that's what I rely on, too. Sometimes I just like to go to a quiet spot, and I like to say, okay, God, what, a, what can I do? And, you know, a lot of times God finds a way for me to be able to make it through when I feel deflated. You know, so what I want you to do this year is rely on your foundation, your faith, the spirit inside you. When you see a friend or a teammate that isn't, well, they feel a little deflated, maybe you can help them out. There are a lot of different ways that you can make someone's year by being a friend, by welcoming them, by helping them out. We've got that. God gives us the way inside all of us. But sometimes we have to be still and we have to listen to God and listen to what he wants us to do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have a faith foundation where we can help others. We can inspire others. We can lead others. Lord, we all know that we are sometimes deflated. And sometimes it's hard to know what to do. But Lord, we are thankful that we have places we can come like Sunday School and Worship Express and Church and Worship where we can listen to you and know how we can inflate ourselves again to do what you want us to do. In your name we pray. Amen. All aboard for Worship Express. One of the best parts of Sunday worship, Worship Express and Children's Time. I'd like to take this opportunity to not, to not tell you all about Klondike Kids Club, but to tell you four stories from Klondike Kids Club, four stories that have touched my heart over the last three semesters, and I hope will touch yours and let you know how important our support is, both as volunteers and financially and through your prayers. And if you want to know more, I'll be outside after services. The first story I want to tell you is about a little girl named Mary. And Mary was in third grade last, last May. And she had been coming since we started the year before in January. Her attendance the first semester wasn't very predictable, but there was a reason. She's the oldest of her family. She has twin brothers and a mom who works. And so as the oldest, a lot of responsibility fell on her and her time. And so academics had to come in second for, for her often. But Beginning last September, Mary's attendance was really very regular. She didn't need a lot of encouragement to join us twice a week. And at the end of school, the last couple of weeks of school, she came literally running into our class, which is all volunteer, both for the kids and for everybody but our two staff, staff people. She came running in and she just was beaming from ear to ear Miss Jennifer, Miss Denny, guess what, guess what? What? I don't have to go to summer school this year. It's the first time I've never had to go to summer school. And teachers tell us that the personalized attention that she received for three semesters, they felt made an enormous difference in her academic success and in her self-confidence. The second child I want to tell you about is a fourth grader. And this little girl, who I'll call Kathy, had a lot of things that were not going for her, including a home situation and difficulty in controlling her temper. Kathy came to us all, all for two semesters and was doing really well and doing good work. It, her academics were not a matter of not 
being intelligent. It was a need for compassion and consistency from an adult. But about halfway through our second semester this year, she came in to tell us that she was going to have to move to a new house. And she was sort of happy about it because she was going to live with her grandmother. But she was sort of sad because she really loved coming to Klondike Kids Club. Quite by accident, I met Kathy in Battleground this summer at uh, the Eye Opener Cafe, where I was having breakfast and she was coming in with her grandmother. And when she saw me, again, her eyes sparkled and she came running over to me and she said, guess what, guess what? I said, what? And she said, I got promoted. I'm going to be in fifth grade next year. And she said, then she said to me, and you know, I think my anger issues are much better under control now. It, does, it warms your heart to be part of that. The third story I want to tell you about, because you all have been involved in this, is a little boy who came to us in kindergarten a year and a half ago. And he came into our first semester with his mom. They had just gotten here from Mexico. And this little guy came in with his hoodie on and the hood pulled down so all you could see was this face. And if it could have gone any farther down, he would have had it there. And as he, as he signed in, and his mother said goodbye and kept saying to him, you'll be okay, you'll be okay, he just had tears silently rolling down his cheeks. And he went over to the, for story time and with his snack and then went to the kindergarten table where he had his own volunteer. And he began to learn the words he needed. He began to learn the math skills he needed. Both of his parents were working, so and they didn't understand the language. It makes a difference. This year, he came in on the first day of Kids Club with his head held high, the hoodie back, took off his hoodie, hung it up, and got to work. No tears, just a renewed sense of himself and the success he felt like he was achieving. But it's not all about kids. Our vision is about families, too. And at the end of the year, in addition to field trips, we have an all-family cookout. Everybody's invited. Parents, kids, grandma, cousins. And let me tell you, it is a big gathering. We pull out all our tables and chairs. But the important thing to us is that almost all the families are there with their kids, and they bring things to eat to share. We bring the hamburgers and hot dogs, and we ran out of everything. We had so many this year. And folks from First Church come and man the grills and help us get set up. And it is such a joy to meet all of these parents. And even with our language differences, we know how to say thank you to each other, and we know how to say you're welcome, and we know how to say your child is precious. I love your child. And we're making a difference, First Church. But we need you. We need your time as a volunteer. You don't have to be a pro. All you have to have is a heart for kids and a willingness to be there with them. Or if that's not what you can do, you can support us financially. Or most importantly, this has all been you and a congregation that has prayed for this ministry and outreach for the better part of three years, and it's come to fruition through you. So I would just invite you to consider this as another opportunity to be in service as the fa family of faith that you are, and join me and the other volunteers at Klondike Kids Club. Now I'm looking for, ah, there you are, Dan. Dan Howell wants to talk to you a little bit about Disciple Bible Study. Bible Study, Disciple Bible Study. I don't know why I'm tripping over my words today, but forgive me. I guess it, it just proves that 
like the scripture, we're not perfect yet. But Dan, will you come and, t and share a bit with us again about Disciple Bible Study? Thank you. Some of you have heard part of this before. Some of you have not. In July, we announced that the full foundational course in Disciple Bible Study will be offered this academic year. And uh, Pastor Denny and Pastor Steve made statements of support for that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time today testifying to it. It's really good. It will give you a, a stronger overall view of the Bible. It'll help you read passages. It'll strengthen your, your faith life if you are doing worship and study and volunteer missional roles all at the same time. They'll all feed on each other. But the thing I need to tell you in particular today is that because of reasons of schedule, we need to know by next Sunday who's going to be in the, in the group. And uh, if you're talking with people or if you're considering it, keep that in mind. Some of the details are in the bullet or in the announcements, including my contact information, and I'll be at the table out in the narthex after the service. So thank you, thank you for your prayers for this ministry. I'm gonna run and make the announcement in the other service. So many opportunities. Let's look around. So many people, and we are just part of the number. God asks us to be still and to know that God is God. I'd like to invite you to a si time of silence as re we remember the individuals on our prayer list. I would ask you to include Ryan Merkel, young man whose grandmother is on our staff, Joanna Cook. Um, they're doing some diagnostic work and it's scary. So please include Ryan on the prayer list, as well as all of those situations and people that you find on your heart, in your thoughts this morning. Let's be in an attitude of prayer. Thank you, God, for this season of sun and slow motion, for the long evenings with the sound of the crickets and frogs, for the wonder of lightning bugs, the brilliance of evening stars and moon, which speak to us of your presence in the universe, for the rain and the rainbows and the cool breezes. It is good to have time to rejoice in the smells and the sounds and the beauty of your creation. Precious ones, send the gift of your spirit to fill this place, your people, and the world. Set us free to try new ways of living, free to forgive, free to love, free to join in the battle for justice and peace. Free us to rejoice as children of your spirit. God, forgive us for all the grievances that we can remember all too well. Save us from self-pity, self-seeking, and false-heartedness. We forget that your gifts to us are not rights, but gifts. Guide us and drive us, if need be, into the hard ways of sacrifice, which are just and loving. Open our eyes to, your neighbor, to our neighbor's needs and goodness. Give us the will for peacemaking and for confronting power with a call to compassion. Open our hearts for the unloved, who are the hardest to love and touch, and yet are those who need it the most. Holy One, dull the envy in us, which criticizes and complains. Keep us honest and tender enough to be healed of hypocrisies. Breathe into us, your children, a restlessness and courage to make something new, something saving, and something true. 
Come, Lord Jesus, startle us with your presence today. Open our hearts to praise you. Open our spirits to worship you. Open us to live life as authentically and boldly as you lived yours. We humbly come to you, praying the words you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. heard me say things before about how I appreciate music and uh, how I feel it's a part of our worship and and uh, I would add to that the, that the applause is totally appropriate not as an appreciation for performance although we can appreciate the performance as well but because the music opens a new window for us every new time that we hear music uh, or new music it, it opens a new window for us to, to see through in our uh, enhanced relationship with with our Lord because of what we know now because of music and what it has, uh, the window that it has opened for us. So thank you for opening the window for us this morning. The uh, gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to Luke. 
and it's not, um, not the easiest piece of scripture that we've ever listened to. It gives us insight into Jesus and the fullness of his humanity, uh, knowing the uh, time of his ministry is growing short and, and uh, the eventuality of it. We read from chapter 12, verses 49 through 56. Jesus initially is uh, speaking to his disciples, and the final portion then is to crowds gathered to hear him. I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. We all understand now because we have the benefit of history what he means exactly by uh, what it is when it's completed, that is, when it is done and he has hung on the cross. He goes on to say, do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it's going to rain, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? So ends our reading of Holy Scripture. May God add blessing to our hearing of this holy and inspired word and grant us renewal in our soul. So for the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Uh, I would invite you to take a look at the picture on the front of the bulletin. Uh, we have a, a wonderful uh, likeness of it on the screen as well. But uh, you can see... Uh, what it is, it's a hurricane cloud that's uh, photographed from uh, above, either by uh, people in a plane or perhaps by satellite, we don't know, but, but by the result of technology, we can look down upon this cloud and, and uh, know what it is, and right in the middle of it there is the, the eye so well defined around which everything else turns. You know what a cloud is made up of? cloud is a bunch of tiny little droplets of water. In this case, <laughs> millions and millions of tiny little droplets of water, but they are all together in this cloud, and in that way they come to be uh, in commonality. Each one is distinct unto itself, but in the cloud they are all together. So I would suggest to you that... Uh, we're a cloud like that. Each one of us are a distinct little droplet of water, but all together we become a huge cloud. And that's what the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews was talking about this morning, being surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses from all places and all times. There are witnesses that are the little droplets of water that come to build the whole body of Christ, and the whole body is this great cloud the distinction being that in the hurricane cloud, we see this glorious thing <laughs> from above, but we know that below it, there's a storm raging that's uh, probably less than favorable in the outcome uh, if it's passing over land, and it will result in things happening that may not be uh, just real favorable. So what do we learn from that? <laughs> Well, we learn that things aren't always the way we want them to be, for one thing. As with a great wind that blows across, whether it's circulating or going as a straight line wind, it can do great damage. So should we draw from that that the great cloud of witnesses can do great damage uh, in the world, even though they look like a wonderful thing? I suppose, I suppose we'd say, well, yes, some damage can be done by the great cloud witnesses because they are people just like us or were. 
They now have, however, created that which we inherit, and it's our purpose to continue that, to continue to build on that, and leave it for those generations that will come after us who will look at the great cloud of witnesses and, and see us in it as well as they look at all the little droplets of water that make up the great cloud. Each one of us will be one of the little droplets. That seems like it's uh, just kind of, a <laughs> as the expression goes, a drop in the bucket, or in this case, a, a little drop in the cloud, and that we wouldn't make much difference. But I assure you that if you as the little droplet are added, something changes. The cloud becomes greater. The cloud accomplishes something that it wouldn't accomplish if you as that little droplet weren't present. And you as that little droplet being removed from the great cloud makes it different. And that great cloud is unable to accomplish everything that it could have accomplished with you as a little droplet present. That's because you, as a little droplet, <laughs> but as a child of God, as an intended person within the whole body of Christ, you have special gifts that only you can bring. And you are called to tasks that only you can accomplish. Oh, the Lord can accomplish God's will in many ways. And if you refuse to be compliant, if you refuse to, to do what uh, you understand yourself to be called to do, God can accomplish it in some other way and, and will if it's important. But you are significantly present in a way that nobody else can be. We see that this morning. We are present as a congregational family here, and as you heard me remark before, this, this will never be again. We are in this time and in this place an absolutely unique cloud of witnesses witnessing and experiencing the great cloud of witnesses that surround us in a spectacular and special way, and it will never happen again. We are at an absolutely unique time in eternity, which is already underway. And I would suggest to you that your presence makes it better and stronger and more special than it could be without your presence. And oh, by the way, if you get up and leave, <laughs> we'll be different without your presence as well. So this great cloud of witnesses does what? Well, for one thing, it's the result of our faith. The writer to the letter of Hebrews made it clear that faith is an issue. By faith, people passed through the Red Sea. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, Rahab was made okay because she received the spies in peace. And, and, and the piece of scripture that's left out here goes through a whole bunch more of by faith, by faith, and so on and so forth. And the writer then gets to a point where he says, and what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and so forth. There's so much to tell about the great cloud of witnesses that we don't have time to tell it all. Yet all of these, the writer says, though they were commended for their faith, and these are all, by the way, Old Testament people, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. So though their faith was great, and so their faith was profound, and so Many things were accomplished because of their faith. It was not the perfect faith. And they were waiting for perfection to come. So we hear, as the writer goes on, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses that we, we understand. So let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, who is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured what was to come. Jesus Christ proclaimed as the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, so that the faith that we learn from all of the people in the Old Testament, the faith that accomplished so many things, was waiting still for the perfecting of that faith in Jesus Christ. So now in the gospel lesson, we hear Jesus, <laughs> who is the perfecter of our faith, 
in this moment of absolute humanity, in the moment where he is fully exposing himself as absolutely and perfectly human and carrying all the emotions that you carry and that I carry, explaining to his disciples who seem not to understand in so many ways. He says, I came to bring fire to the earth. And I wish it were already kindled because I have a baptism with which to be baptized and what stress I'm under until it's completed. Boy, I'd like for this to be over with. Because he knew that when it was completed, he was returning to the holy and blessed Trinity when he was returned to heaven to sit at the right hand of the throne. He realized that this was his time on earth, that he was dealing with this cloud of witnesses that were sometimes thick-necked people and and uh, always were apparently trying to trip him up and find ways not to believe in him. Were trying to find ways that they could justify treating him badly. And he, in the fullness of his humanity, had times where he re responded to that by saying, Doggone it, why don't you just stop this? This is not the way I want to lead my life. If I had my druthers about it, everything would be fine. He says, do you think I've come to bring peace to the earth, to, to shower the whole earth so that we all have just this time of ooh and ah and isn't everything wonderful? He said, no. It's not the purpose of what it's all. It's, you're here to do something. Sometimes, sometimes that will be uncomfortable. But our relationship with each other is significant, and it's based upon the perfecter of our faith and our relationship with the perfecter of our faith, however you understand that to be. And each one of us, as an individual little droplet of water in the great cloud, understand it in our own way. And it's revealed to us in particular and specific ways that mean something to us in an individual and particular way. So Jesus says, you see a cloud rising in the west, you know it's going to rain. You say, oh, it's going to rain, and it does. You see the south wind blowing, coming up in this case, and coming up from the desert and being very hot, and you say, well, it's going to get hot, and it gets hot. He says you ought to be able to read the indicators of the coming kingdom <laughs> of eternity in just the same way. And if you work on your relationship in faith through me, you'll understand how to interpret the present time as we look forward to the time to come. One of the things that's talked about is family. Jesus says very clearly our families are not going to be the singular issue. And while families are important to us, and are the creation of God in whatever form they take, Jesus is saying, if you idolize the family and hold it up to be the only thing, you are idolizing the wrong thing. That even the family is not the thing that you should focus on when you're dealing with your faith and your faith issues, but rather our relationship with Jesus Christ. Things happen in families things that we prefer not happen often, but also things that happen with great joy. My second son uh, named Nicholas, uh, we have two Nicholases in our family because we're a reformed family. <laughs> and my stepson is also named Nicholas, but uh, Nicholas, my second son, uh, is in a reformed family. His wife, Angie, brought to their relationship a son who is named Dylan, who uh, had reached 22 or 23 years of age. And last Friday morning, a couple of days ago, they found Dylan uh, had hanged himself. And so in this moment of great despair, my son texted me uh, after I had tried to call him and, and didn't get an answer to the phone and left a message. He, he texted me and he said, Dad, I can't talk about it now. So I said, okay. And in this moment, I could not be his counselor. Uh, I could only be his dad, which I tried to be as best I can. His, um, his awareness of this moment is exacerbated by the fact that his mother, 
my first wife uh, had committed suicide. And so at that point, I couldn't be his counselor either. I could only try to be his dad. Some of you have been through perhaps the same thing or similar things. You know those moments when you can't be a counselor, you simply have to be in relationship. That's what Jesus is talking about. Nicholas was my son who said, Dad, I don't have to go to church in order to be a Christian. <laughs> and I said, I know you're right, Nick. That's, that's, that's accurate. But people go to church for one thing, to practice being better at being Christians because you gather around with a bunch of other people who are also practicing to be better Christians because none of us are perfect in it. We need Jesus to be the perfecter of our faith. Nicholas has discovered something about this on his own without my teaching him, without my preaching to him, without my counsel. He's now attending a church, and, and I, I am happy about that. I am also happy that he is going to a United Methodist Church <laughs> as opposed to some others. The last text I got from him said, Dad, I'll be okay. And I know he will. I'm as concerned about Angie as I am about Nicholas, but they'll be okay. They're in the hands of a God who loves them, and they know it. And they have folks around them that love them, and they know it. And we'll give them all the strength and whatever we can to do whatever they need to do to get through the situation they're in. I have faith in that because I have faith in Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, who created all of us and who empowers us and who helped us understand that we are a little bitty drop of water in a great cloud of witnesses that surround us and give us what we need whenever we need it because we can turn to that great cloud of witnesses for sustenance. Even as we turn to the Lord for sustenance, we are the part of God's intention that helps us sustain those who are around us. That means something. And it means that we are not just to say, well, let's be peaceful, but to say, wrapped in the love of God, we are called to be active. Active in a lot of different ways. However, each one of us are equipped to be active, and that's different for each one of us. So I want to wrap up by uh, saying, <laughs> volunteer. <laughs> we are kicking off our program year. There are a lot of opportunities that have been presented and talked about so uh, nicely by Pastor Denny. There are things in the bulletin. Uh, next week we will have a, a lot of things on display for you to take a look at and see how you might volunteer. You know, volunteer means I'm willing to do something or I want to do something. The things that we do are the things that we want to do more than we want not to do them. <laughs> so I hope that you'll find things that fall into that realm of what you want to do. And if you don't find something in the roles of our ministry and teams and things that are going on, our mission, develop something because you have special gifts that nobody else has. And you can bring to our congregational family something that nobody else can which means you can contribute to the whole body of Christ, the great cloud of witnesses, something that nobody else can. So let us all be together in our witness and in the cloud. Amen. Our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And this week, we celebrate the 200 guests who attended the international dinner last Sunday evening and all of the volunteers who contributed their time and their talents and their energy. And last night, I attended Outfest for the first time. Along, and we represented First United Methodist Church. There, we were one of seven churches that found their way to Outfest to welcome people, whoever they are. And there were families, and there were high school kids, and there were college kids, and there were costumes, and there were not costumes. But I want you to know that that is another ministry 
that your gifts and talents and tithes support is our outreach into the community. You make it possible. And so once again, I invite you to give generously as we worship God through our gifts and our tithes and our offerings.
the whole and universal body of our Lord Jesus Christ go forward into the days of the week to come knowing you are the body of Christ, knowing that you are the great cloud of witnesses, and you as one little drop in that great cloud make a difference to all those with whom you come in contact. May the joy and the blessing, the salvation and grace of God the Father Almighty, Jesus Christ the Son, and the indwelling Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. Thank you very much.